I can just start. I'll do the starting intro, and then you can just do your call for for volunteers. Okay. Yeah, the the numbers are going up too. Here, people are coming in. Yeah, I see it's it's going up. So, hello everyone, and welcome to designing your research agenda two point one. Um, and a special welcome to all of those who this is your first DI event. So I'm Liz DeLuna, one of, of the chairs and the director of programming of Design Incubation. And we have three other chairs here. Dan Wong is the chair and founder. And luckily, Heather Quinn and Jess Barnes are leading this event. So Design Incubation began in New York City in 2014, and it was through a series of conversations among design educators who realized that while we have the greatest number of design educators anywhere in the country, we're all still sort of we're siloed in our own institutions. And we really didn't know what faculty at other institutions were doing in terms of teaching and research. So today, the goal of Design Incubation is to support and elevate communication design. And if you're not already on our mailing list, go to the website and sign up and we are actually still looking for volunteers to help us and dan is going to tell you a little bit more about that sure and i actually just uh found the little feature so people should be able to chat now so i was just hunting for um that little bird feature welcome everybody and oh here we we have people coming so we're at 26 now um what i just wanted to um let people know that we uh are always looking for volunteers um to help us uh with the organization and um everything else when it comes to design incubation um the, we um please if you're interested send us your cv and your interest um uh, there's a lot of opportunity in various areas so it's really dependent on what you're interested in what we are looking for is a two-year commitment so if you are looking to um, become one of the directors or a volunteer of some sort um please let us know and what you're interested in. Uh, and now I'm gonna move it, pass it along to Heather and Jess, so you guys can introduce uh, today's event. Hi everyone, I'm Heather Quinn. Um, sorry about that, I was muted. Um, just a couple other announcements. We have the CAA panel coming up. I can't remember the exact date, but you can see that on our website as well. Um, some of you that are here are part of that uh, event, which is great. Um, that colloquium is always really powerful because we have so many people from so many different disciplines. Um, and the other announcement is that um, we do have a call for a colloquium host this fall. So if you know Jess, I think hosted the last one at, at Kent State. Um, I have hosted one at DePaul previously. Um, they can both be a uh, virtual or physical um, design incubation really helps support you in this event. So if you're looking to sort of connect uh, with your school or bring people together again, either physically or virtually or uh, elevate some of your work doing um, some research and service, uh, it's really great to do. I encourage it um, again, just email us and let us know that you're interested and we try to get that moving pretty quickly. Um, and Heather just chat, I mean, sorry, Camilla just chatted here that the uh, CAA date is February 18th, 9.30 a.m., Thank you. I guess, Perfect. Eastern time. And that one is also virtual. So I know in the past years, um, the CAA colloquium has been in person previously, but we are still virtual this year. Um, so just so you know. Um, okay, so on to designing your research agenda. So this is actually the third iteration of it, although we kicked off the first one um, at an affiliated society meeting at CAA. Um, and in that first one, Jess and I shared our work, Dan shared his work, Penny shared her work, and Ayako um, shared her work. So we had quite a few practitioners. Um, and what we learned is that um, we had a tremendous interest in this event. Um, and we brought it to the table because uh, we were discovering that um, designers were really looking to better understand creative practice and research trajectories, what was working at different types of institutions and in, in different places in, in their careers, um, and how they could learn more about getting support, whether internally or externally, depending on uh, you know, where they came from and where they were hoping to go. Um, part of these presentations, we like to keep it comfortable and also kind of talk about some of the things we struggle with, some of our hopes and desires. Um, 
And with each event, we really work pretty hard to bring people from a diversity of backgrounds, um, including the type of work that they're doing, the type of institution that they're at, and where they are at in their career. Um, and so I think you'll see that if you look back across previous events and who we have here today. Um, so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Jess, who will announce our very esteemed guests. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm Jessica Barnes, and I'm um, one of the co-chairs for Design Incubation. Uh, we have three panelists with us today. We're so excited to have you all with us. Uh, we have Kate um, Hollenbach from University of Denver. We have Lisa Mayoni from Kansas City Art Institute, and we have Matthew Wazinski from the University of Cincinnati. Um, the way this works, um, each panelist has about 10 minutes to share their slide deck and talk about the research agendas. And then after that, we open it up for um, Q&A and discussion. So uh, without further ado, uh, Kate, you're first. All right, hi everyone. I'm gonna get my screen sharing set up. Should be slides now. All right, well, hi, I'm Kate Hollenbach. Uh, thank you to the Di design incubation team for having me here. Uh, in this short talk, I'll cover my career as a designer, artist, and academic. And currently I'm interested in the vernacular of interface design and how software affects language, gesture, and visual culture. Currently, I'm an assistant professor in the Emergent Digital Practices Program at University of Denver. And University of Denver uh, is a liberal arts university in Colorado. Uh, we offer interdisciplinary degree programs for undergraduates and graduate students. And our faculty research in Emergent Digital Practices uh, and our course offerings cover a broad range of topics, including interactive media, graphic design, game design, installation art, biomedia, and creative coding. And just in case anyone in the audience is thinking about attending graduate school next year, uh, I'll mention that the priority deadline for our MA and MFA programs uh, is just around the corner coming up next week, but we still accept applications after that too. And before I tell you more about my recent work uh, and interests, I'll start from the beginning of my career uh, working as an interface designer in the tech industry. So I studied computer science as an undergrad, and in 2009, I dropped out of a graphic design uh, graduate program to join a startup in Los Angeles called Oblong Industries. And Oblong was co-founded by John Undercoffler, who is the designer of the Gestural Interfaces and Minority Report. Uh, and when I first joined the company, we were working with uh, glove tracking systems to create experimental data visualizations uh, and other interactive works uh, that users could control with their hands. And later, the company pivoted into product design for collaborative spaces, and I was the design lead for Mezzanine, the company's core product offering, which was a conference room collaboration suite that provided multiple modes of interaction using mobile devices, laptops, and a gestural control device. And after working in the software industry for about six years, I started to wonder what would happen if I was able to make some time to focus on personal work. Uh, so I went back to graduate school at UCLA, where I studied design media arts. And around that time, I found, my, I found myself really fascinated uh, with the phone as a device that, for better or worse, uh, sees a lot of its owner. And I started to wonder, well, what does the phone see exactly? And to answer this question, I started working on an Android app that I called Phone Loves You Too, that would automatically record video from the front and back cameras uh, and from my, from my personal device every time it was unlocked. And so I used the app to record for a whole month, and then I had about 1,100 video clips uh, with anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes of footage per day. And at graduate school, I was really lucky to have access to a space with five projectors and surround, and I decided I would lay out all the clips to watch simultaneously, uh, resulting in the work that you see here. And though the work felt really exposing, uh, I was surprised to find it also felt like hiding in plain sight. There was so much uh, activity going on everywhere that it was hard to focus on any one frame for too long. So I was curious about other ways to look at the videos. Uh, and next, I remixed the footage into a long form video piece lasting 24 hours. And in this piece, both the front and the back camera videos are displayed side by side, uh, arranged in a calendar grid. So the clips are played at the time of day that they were recorded. 
And when a clip ends, it leaves behind the last frame of the trace. And so here we're looking at 7.45 in the morning, which I guess was a common time for me to wake up uh, in grad school. And after making these two works, I felt that they seemed to suggest uh, that phone time was idle time uh, because the virtual activities taking place on the phone were invisible while the physical space looked relatively inactive most of the time. Uh, so in a next iteration of the work, I wanted to see what would happen if I included some of the uh, virtual activities. So this work is called User is Present. And here's a different idea of what waking up in the morning is like. It's much more intimate. Uh, showing personal messages and implying relationships with others. And in this case, some who are close friends and some who are uh, internet acquaintances or people that I don't know very well at all. And the screen activity is action packed, even though I'm just laying in bed. While both previous works had focused on me as a subject, I considered that more of a convenience than a, a goal. It was really easy to use myself as a subject. And for this project, I asked two very, very good and very trusting uh, friends who were already familiar with my work uh, to participate. And the result was an installation with three video portraits, each shown on a large display with the same proportions as a phone screen. And so each video was a different length, resulting in new juxtapositions at every view. At every view. So here are what some of the videos might look like altogether. Accounting for data, you can see the device knows some of our biometrics. It sees this multitask everyday chores with interpersonal communication and tracks us as we get to where we need to go. Uh, but in this work, it's not just the voluntary participants who are implicated. And so too is everyone they know, even from a distance. And this is the nature of our existence online. Can't possibly opt out of every transaction. So I finished the previous iteration of this work in 2017, and toward the end of 2018, I started wanting to show them the work more, but felt uh, unsure about the ethics of showing the work on a larger scale. Uh, so I decided to experiment with some alternative formats. And so this is a bunch of the videos scaled down into a gridded video where the physical gestures and virtual movements from each clip are still visible, but the text from the phone screens uh, isn't legible. And while producing this body of work, I would have said that uh, some guiding questions for my practice are, what happens as computers know and learn more about human bodies? What freedoms and privacies are jeopardized or lost altogether? And how do human bodies change under the pressures of emerged virtual and physical reality? And while I still think about these questions a lot in my practice, a lot has shifted in the last few years. My creative practice really stalled out at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I focused on teaching, which was my job, but I didn't find a lot of new creative inspiration for my practice. Uh, and in the last year or so, things have started coming back together, but I'm at the beginning of a lot of new things and I don't know if they're related yet and exactly what the trajectory will be for the next few years. Uh, so my mode of research at the moment is to try a lot of stuff and see what sticks. And there may be some connecting threads here about uh, touch, life online, uh, and isolation, but let's see. <laughs> So last day of summer 2021 is an artist book that features a speech to text transcript of 24 hours of audio recorded on my last day of summer break in the year 2021. And this was a particularly significant last day of summer because I was returning to teaching in person full time uh, instead of mostly teaching online. So I was feeling a lot of anxiety about what that might be like. Uh, so here's an example of one of the spreads from the book. Lately, I'm also interested in the vocabulary of technology and how it is marketed for a broad audience. And this is a web-based work uploaded to the cloud.com, an actual website you can visit. And I got a little fixated on the idea of the cloud and what the cloud looks like. I rendered a version of this work to show at Nightlights Denver in April, 2022. And so the work was projected on the Denver clock tower. And in the last few months, uh, I've been working on some new video or interactive work. I'm not sure which yet. Uh, this work also involves some wordplay on the idea of home and home screen. And the videos are a collection of textures from in or around uh, my home in Denver, where I moved uh, in 2020 at the peak of the pandemic and really didn't know a lot of people here. So the project is an attempt to share some of the day-to-day uh, -day feel of my life here uh, with uh, friends and family at a distance. Uh, and the last project 
uh, that I'll mention, uh, last creative project I'll mention, uh, I've been revisiting an old unfinished web project about touch and presence. And in this project, the visitor completes the series of swipe gestures and sees the touches of other people visiting the site at the same time. Uh, I'm reworking this project a little bit to add some ambiguity about whether or not the presence of others is real and uh, looking to work with a sound designer to uh, really round out the experience. And so throughout all of this, uh, open source software has played a huge role in my creative practice. And every project in my art practice that I've shown today has at least one open source library for creative coding as a key part of the project somewhere. And so contributing to the development of open source tools for creative work is a core part of my research. Um, P5JS, which some of you may know, is a creative coding library that makes programming accessible to beginners, among others, and I've contributed miscellaneous bug fixes to the library and also some key features like building out the WebGL 3D engine. I've also uh, mentored more recent projects for the library through Google Summer of Code, and I currently serve on the Board of Directors for the Processing Foundation, uh, which oversees the maintenance of tools like P5JS and processing, as well as facilitating public programming and community events related to creative coding. Uh, maintaining a welcoming community is an important part of running an open source project. So I'm currently working with a team uh, from the Clinic for Open Source Arts and the Processing Foundation uh, to organize an open source arts contributors conference, which will be at uh, DU in April. And the conference will be a gathering for open source contributors from uh, different arts related projects to share their knowledge and practices with each other. And lastly, I'll share a little bit about a project that's just getting off the ground, which is a collaboration with Dr. Sanchari Das from DU's computer science program. Uh, we applied for an internal grant at DU to fund some cybersecurity research about interactive art installations that collect information about their uh, viewers. And the long-term goal, goal is to build an open source toolkit to help artists build interactive artworks that are privacy preserving and secure in how they handle viewers or participants' data. So as someone who's made artwork addressing surveillance and user interface design uh, and who works with open source uh, tools for artists, I'm really excited to work on a project that melds these two interests. So nothing to show yet uh, for this one except a tweet announcing that we got the grant, uh, but hopefully more here soon. All right. Thanks for listening. Looking forward to talking more during the Q&A. Thank you, Kate. It was so nice to see all the new stuff. And up next is Lisa. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. So thanks for that. And thanks for that great uh, presentation to kick off. Um, yeah, my name is Lisa Mayoni. I'm an assistant professor of graphic design at the Kansas City Art Institute. And I'm really excited to um, be share some of the context in which um, I've been doing the work I've been doing. Um, so to be clear, I'm Lisa. I'm also a designer, an artist, an educator, a caregiver, an advocate, um, Asian, Asian American. Um, and those pieces of my myself come with me wherever I go, whether I am I am on a Zoom call, um, a classroom, or a physical space. And as I move through those places and bring those bring those aspects of myself, I also bring all of the places that I've been and have called home and have called um, places in which sort of like ideas rose and um, and 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 grew. So um, so place and movement and uh, geography are things that I think about. Um, uh, just some sort of maybe a, on a high level timeline um, uh, as far as you know where or how did my trajectory sort of take me to where I am now. I started studying design in 2001 and worked as a designer at a variety of design studios between 2005 and 14. And you know, thinking back and looking through um, my research, sort of seeing that, you know, beginning to be interested in teaching um, uh, in 2008 or so as an adjunct 
at Parsons, Queens College, um, places that really kind of began to form my questions around, you know, not only, you know, uh, design and what, I, what I'm interested in or what I'm curious about, but kind of where does design go and where does knowing about design or being able to activate design, um, what does it look like when it's out in the world? And I think those spaces really sort of, for me, kind of grew uh, what my understanding of design was. And, um, and beginning to also participate in you know, presenting design, presenting results from classroom settings, from students, from collaborations across schools within Parsons, for example, and kind of seeing that the way that design could be, right, not only the work at um, design studios and the circulation of those works, but also the sort of circulation of maybe exchange and ideas um, uh, within, within the academic setting. Um, after returning to school after about you know, 10 years of working in industry, really trying to sort of flip around what I knew about graphic design, um, and in that sense, uh, returning to teaching in a more full-time mode, I've been at both a, a state university as well as at a private art institution. Um, so just a little bit of color around maybe those experiences, um, you know, sort of coming out of, you know, working for, working in New York City, working on publications, magazines, uh, brands, projects, uh, coming into graduate school. I was very interested in sort of really um, almost um, maybe reconsidering my relationship with the objects of presentation, whether it be the camera, the lens, the projector, the video screen. And while um, some of those things you know, might not, um, you know, th those those passive objects of presentation, um, the mundane uh, was exciting to kind of see that uh, that space was not only generative in the, the thoughts and questions around design, but also uh, the kinds of things that could come out of reconfiguring my relationship with these objects um, and making in different ways. I was still interested in type and typography and what, you know, how the history of things, how the detail of things can really um, sort of color color the experience of reading something, um, but also being interested in how um, language and word um, can do, can be, um, but that writing something does not mean recording something, but writing something might sort of be an opportunity to, to, uh, to bear something for the first time um, and to let it live and to, to let it be an experience both of something that I, that I knew I wanted to say and also things that I didn't know I wanted to say through that process. Um, uh, curious too, um, with collaborative projects with Faze Grenion, for example, kind of looking at the different ways that we might interface and collaborate with one another. This is pre-pandemic, um, uh, maybe back in 2015 or so, um, but thinking about sort of like the ways that we connect and how do these, how do these interfaces that we have um, both maybe, maybe happen um, happen to me, but also happen um, around us and how we can invent within those um, those innocent contexts. Um, so where I am now, I'm at Kansas City Art Institute in the Midwest, um, a little less than 2 million people in the metropolitan area. And the school itself is a four-year private college. It's a teaching institution. It's um, There's about 750 students across all of our majors. And within graphic design, we have um, currently exactly 47 uh, curious graphic design students who are in the, the three rooms that are nearby me right now. Um, so it's really intimate in a way, um, sort of thinking about uh, being able to really sort of you know, dig into to a project and you know look at a room and say this is all of the sophomores, this is all of the people that we've got, um, and to to have these sort of like very direct uh, teaching relationships, and that at first was a huge culture shock in some ways coming from Parsons where there's you know eleven sections of any given class or uh, um, uh, Oklahoma State University where. Um, we're in the context of a college of um, arts and sciences and, uh, you know, looking at, you know, what other parts of the institution we could collaborate with um, in a way sort of appreciating both like what is and isn't at these places. Um, uh, within the context of here, um, you know, designing my research agenda uh, in a way both comes with sort of considering what are these parameters that are expected or or sort of understood perhaps uh, around me. So again, as a teaching institution, um, there's a lot of emphasis on the excellence in teaching and that research and creative output um, might be almost as important and service that sort of feels like it sort of so easily kind of bleeds into both of these spaces um, is technically at 10%, um, but really, really, <laughs> it's more, somehow this becomes more than 100% and always wonder about that. 
Um, and within that sense, I think um, sort of, you know, coming from being an adjunct for a long time, being curious about teaching, um, coming into full-time teaching, um, sort of like loving and relishing the fact that like, oh, wow, like there's these lenses through which this work is. Like, it's not just your, it's a teaching job. It's this cult, this, this um, sort of multifaceted crystal that you get to build and sort of look through and share with and overlap with other people. Um, and also being curious about service, like, yes, yeah, service, service is over here. Or, oh, you know, you can start saying no to things after you get tenure. But really, like those things are really feel very connected and embodied in the teaching that I do in the research that I'm interested in. So somehow these these spaces also connect and share share time um, for better and worse. Um, so here we have a three three load. Um, uh, typically, so for example, I teach on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 8 a.m. to 2.50 p.m. And um, uh, and in between, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, sort of holding space for, you know, all of the committee meetings and department meetings on all of which are sort of like the rhythms of the, the week. And Thursdays sort of being almost like a research day, um, sort of holding as much of the space as it can be. And somewhere in between um, uh, these really important committees that um, I, 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 I choose to give time and space for. Um, you know, in that sense, I just went through the tenure application process, so we'll see what happens here. Um, but all the same, you know, sort of even revisiting these words of, you know, how it is it that, um, that here we define creative activity and scholarship um, and the sort of range of things that, you know, quote unquote, count towards that. Um, you know, in some ways I find myself, I don't think I've spent too much time with this text in a way I'm sort of just like, all right, let's just get down to, to the work and just do it, right? But being able to revisit this language is something that is also, you know, part of the expectation or part of the um, sort of like the yearly annual review. Um, and as I think about, you know, what am I doing when I'm when I'm a designer these days? In some ways, it's almost like toggling between these four words and wondering, you know, is it am I designer, an artist, researcher, writer? Am I designer, an artist, designer, research, educator? Um, a designer, an educator. It's almost like there's like a small, tiny crisis every time writing the short bio. Um, but it's almost like through that tiny lens, right? Like that tiny sort of decision, um, I get to think a little bit differently around like what I'm prioritizing or how I even see, you know, where I'm coming from at that very moment. Um, uh, in a way, it's maybe, I don't, you know, dare I say fun to be able to, um, to know that these sort of different spaces that I inhabit um, are always related because part of it is that I am carrying them with me and in a way sort of use all four sort of maybe of these spaces. And um, for example, um, as I approach, you know, as I approach education, as I approach pedagogical questions, um, uh, some of the things I'm interested in, the things, some of the things that sort of continue to maybe, maybe more accurately sort of continue to follow me or I continue to follow them. Um, uh, and in these, um, I see sort of they're you know, beginning to sort of clarify or maybe crystallize the relationships between, um, you know, how I approach my questions as, um, you know, as when I'm teaching graphic design history is how those questions relate to the kinds of things I might want to write about or the kinds of places that I might want to bring in as I'm thinking about those things, you know, almost like through having now taught at those kinds of classes, maybe now for five or six years, it's like just beginning to sort of see, oh, like how, how smoothly these connections, not that they are so smooth, but that they can be um, you know, not just for one space or the other, but they are they are able to share um, that energy. Um, the idea of lens-based mediation, right, whether it be images or video or otherwise, um, these are things that sort of continue to be sort of like the spaces that I invent um, in the studio and having a studio aside from this office um, here at school. Um, having a studio space down in the West Bottoms kind of allows me to sort of have the literal time space you know, large piece of paper, um, print out the photographs that I've been taking um, and see them, see them not just as, you know, now I'm a, it's not that I'm a photographer, but I'm using photography as a way to activate questions that I, that I have and to have something to respond to, to write about, you know, we're taking this rock that I have questions about in relation to um, some of, uh, uh, you know, some family stories and wondering about how that then sort of ran, runs into um, my questions about um, those portals and clusters in those photographs. Um, just in preparation or in, in, you know, through the conversation of this panel, sort of thinking, you know, what are the kinds of spaces in which I think I 
contribute to or think that my work belongs in. Um, I mean, in some ways, I see these kinds of lists and it feels like all of them feel like part of what this work is. Um, uh, but, um, but being able to put these kinds of almost like official words alongside things that, you know, feel a little bit sort of maybe fuzzier or softer. Um, um, and in that fuzziness and softness, you know, these, like, what are the challenges that I have at my institution? Um, or, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I, I feel like I have all this stuff that I want to say. Like, I, I think I was telling someone recently that I have this sort of like pent up stuff that I want to write. Um, so really kind of really like give, making that Thursday and making a few times during my week more more prioritizing of of writing which has been helping and it's been incredible to be able to begin to see like okay just slowly like I was like letting letting it out or like giving it time um because teaching <laughs> the service <laughs> um when 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 is really the question um uh, but um but in a way like it's it's up it it is it it must be like I cannot not um do this work so it has to fit it has to be a part of this things that are on the plate at the moment. I'm happy to talk about these um, in other detail in this conversation or at any other time, um, but sort of looking at, um, you know, sort of taking, bringing in my interest in data visualization and al alongside my interest in sort of emotional valences and psychology and um, sort of bringing, bringing references that have been kind of in separate, you know, physical or literal or, or metaphorical folders um, and setting and having the opportunity to be able to talk about them at the same time. Um, uh, being able to bring in um, uh, through what I what I think is becoming a photo essay, um, an article about memory loss and um, uh, dementia, and sort of uh, maybe say object object resonances. Um, I've uh, been writing collaboratively with a colleague of mine um, at University of Arkansas, uh, uh, assistant professor uh, Dina Ben Rahim, um, sort of you know having a consistent conversation around our teaching of graphic design histories um, and the approaches to that and and bringing bringing that um, to clarity both in the projects that we've done together as well as the um, sort of writing that we're that we're working on uh, simultaneously. Um, and in writing collaboratively, sort of finding myself wanting to clarify my own voice even more, I think even in beginning to sort of write collaboratively with a colleague um, uh, has has sort of made me understand that feeling confident and um, uh, able to contribute my own words um, and um, uh, and uh, clarity of my uh, writing process separately from that, just as as a muscle or or muscle sort of maybe set that I'm building uh, has become increasingly clear. And in that curiosity, uh, or in that curiosity of writing, um, been thinking a lot about dementia and care work, um, and um, and how those might relate to some of my my design work, and this is photography that I've been uh, working on for the last few years. Um, you know, how does this intersect with 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 writing, with essays? Um, is that part of the work? Is that is that you know is is, is that design research? Um, um, so some of the things I'm I've been interested in um, over, uh, since the first week of um, my time at, at KCAI, um, my parents' house was flooded during Hurricane Harvey. So it's almost like I start KCAI and two days in, um, in a way, sort of like this 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 almost object occurs, and that object has been something that I've been sort of studying and looking at and thinking about um, and building with. Uh, both through imagery at the immediate moment, um, but then also through kind of my my own parents' kind of like re uh, maybe reconfigurations and um, both physically and mentally um, back into the space and wondering about um, you know sort of like different theoretical models for sort of talking about sort of objects and trauma and um, and the dementia of a person and the dementia of objects, the dementia of a um, and the maybe the dementiatic <laughs> space that um, that a home that is full and is empty has, and um, and it's been exciting to kind of explore you know how words and and maybe my perspective as a person who is looking through the lens as a designer um, may build. So these projects, these projects are 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 within the web um, that I've been building here. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, Matthew. 
is up next. Okay, Your hello turn. everybody. Thank you, apologies. I've uh, mentioned earlier, I've got children off school today, so I'm doing that game. Oops, Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Wazinski. Uh, I'm an associate professor and the graduate program director for the Master of Design program at the University of Cincinnati. Um, my presentation today is called There Is No Center, which I hope starts to mean something over the next 10 minutes. Um, it's also kind of a placeholder title I use sometimes when I'm proposing research that I don't quite know where it's going yet. So it's a recurring theme sometimes. Um, and my presentation is a little bit different. I'm going to share um, not so much about the work as maybe some of the things that I've learned in the last um, decade, um, going from a practicing designer into some kind of designer in academic settings. So um, as a brief kind of overview of some of the places I've been, um, my first few degrees said graphic design on them. My first job title said interaction design on it. <laughs> so uh, my uh, practical background starts at that kind of intersection, um, has spent uh, 20 years in all kinds of different contexts and design practice somewhere between these things, um, and um, began my academic career in 2000. 13 with my first um, tenure track appointment at the University of Illinois at Chicago, um, had been at the University of Cincinnati since 2015, am currently um, working towards a PhD in transition design at Carnegie Mellon, and I've just recently accepted a new faculty position at the University of Michigan, where I'll be getting um, uh, in the fall uh, a brand new program called Urban Technology. And so it's a whole new <laughs> transition, a lot of backstory there, uh, moving from a tenured position into a professor of practice position, but also from a school of design into a much more um, interdisciplinary kind of space. So, um, you know, these, these two words <laughs> can be used in a lot of different ways to mean a lot of different things. And I think one of the things that um, began to become clear to me in my first uh, tenure track appointment um, it had to do with the fact that I, all, all of my uh, teaching experiences are now in R1 public universities. And so the kind of expectations around publications and grants and all the things that carry with that were um, you know, different from my experiences as a practicing designer in a lot of ways. But um, it's been helpful for me to think about what these two words mean in, in two you know, grossly oversimplified ways. Um, one of them has to do with the way that practical design methods of all kinds um, for me, have proven to be very valuable um, when doing research with people in other fields. And so um, the simple ability of knowing how to make things like books and websites and exhibitions and films and things like that has been really productive in working with uh, faculty in the humanities or social sciences or whatever. So design as a way of participating in, in really sort of inter and multidisciplinary kinds of uh, inquiries has been um, exciting and, and sort of a natural fit. And then on the other side, um, to use the words of Christopher Fraley and thinking about um, research that might be for design or into design or through design, um, thinking about inquiries that can be productive back towards design in, in whatever way we sort of draw that as a discipline. Of course, it's never that simple, right? And so these things sort of um, redirect and overlap and get confusing all the time. But um, in some ways, these frameworks just help me think about what my role might be or how I might approach whatever things um, pop up next. I also found um, this um, kind of framing from Johan Redstrom to be really helpful. <laughs> I wish I read this before I went through the whole tenure process. It might have clarified some things, but um, I didn't. Um, I read it later, and it seemed to make sense to what I'd experienced. Um, and what Redstrom, it's this great book called Making Design Theory, and um, he identifies this really broad spectrum between the specificity of a single design something and the really broad contours of what designing is in general. And we have a lot of terms that might be familiar along that axis, but in the middle, he identifies this term program. And I, I, this is great when you think about, you know, what are you defining? And the thing you might be defining is a program. A program is, is bigger than a single project. It would be comprised of a lot of projects. It might last a decade, for example. Um, and it might also feed into making some larger scale design things like practices. And so, um, the, I think what's really helpful in this kind of framing is, is not only the sort of flexibility of these scales, but also that you can't really define these things with words alone. And so um, what Redstrom would, would say is that to really define a, a design program, whether that's a, a practical program or a research program, you need experiments. Um, you need uh, a bunch of 
uh, activities and outcomes and things that you can point to to say, this is the program. The program is, is somehow um, bounded by these kinds of activities that words may only start to describe, but the projects themselves um, help, help solidify and make more robust that definition. So um, I just thought of this when thinking of the title of this, um, this event, defining your, your research agenda. Um, I think it, it comes from some, some of this experimentation. And what Redstrom says is that after a series of such experiments, we'll have come to know quite well the central positions of the design space created by this program, which we might not, uh, I guess, know quite well before we go into it. So in my own experience, um, you know, it's been now a decade, it's hard to believe, <laughs> the days are short. Um, or sometimes the days are very long <laughs> and the years go even faster. Um, but it was um, certainly a, a lot of different kinds of experiments. Uh, some things were maybe mini programs in and of themselves. Um, during the, the lead up to receiving tenure in 2018, 2019, um, switched institutions one time. And so um, in some ways challenging, but in some ways beneficial um, networks and, and uh, projects and collaborations were able to continue and expand in different ways. Um, and I think that um, what, what happened was that these experiments were happening in a kind of loosely defined way. I didn't maybe really know what the program or how many programs were happening here. Uh, and then I had to submit for tenure. At some point, there was a deadline, which is really helpful. Um, and these things had to be more clearly articulated and defined. And I'm not sort of saying this is the best way to do it, but this is the way that I experienced it, that these things um, sort of freely fed one thing into the next and eventually um, had to begin to add up. Um, being in, a, you know, R1 universities, there's a, you know, kind of all, almost audit culture of outputs. So that's always somewhere in the back of your mind, I suppose. Um, what I've tried to kind of diagram here is where kind of significant things happened, whether those were publications, grants, or um, creative outputs from the work. Um, it was great to put this together for this presentation. I've never looked at it this way before, but what's probably not at all surprising is it starts with a lot of creative work, and then slowly grants start to happen, and slowly publications happen. And of course, like right after the 10-year deadline, a bunch of publications happened because you're writing all of them, but they didn't get published yet. So all of these kinds of ebbs and flows um, in which nothing is um, you know, nothing is really all that clearly delineated, and yet they're all sort of feeding and pushing each other uh, in different directions. And so um, what I came to discover when it was time to, to you know, describe this and present it was that there were really, I think, two different programs happening. Uh, one of them um, came to be known as having to do with um, uh, participatory design and its relationship to public health. And this was, again, not clearly spelled out at the start of this work, but um, started to become evident through a series of different experiments and projects. And another one had to do with um, speculative design and its relationship to urban futures. And I already have my first interruption. I'm Daddy. Can you say, can you say hi? And then can you go do that in just a minute? I'm Daddy, can you download this <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> So uh, anyway, and here we are. Um, so uh, you know these things these things became evident a little bit you know through the process of of the evolution of the work itself, and of course having to having to describe it um, in an application for tenure and. Um, and things also change, you know, along the way. And so, um, you know, there's kind of this lull in publications that started to happen right after tenure. And it's not because I was getting lazy, but I was actually writing a book, which took a while. Um, and so that the, the publication of that book, uh, which came out earlier uh, last year, 2022, has also come to identify uh, kind of a new, I don't know what sort of a synthesis, but it was sort of a next phase, I think a new research program um, that's unfolding now. And I, I, I guess I can kind of give it a name because there's a book <laughs> attached to it, but uh, maybe the name will change in another uh, eight years or so. And somehow this new program is, is what I think is starting to stitch together what I'm doing at Carnegie Mellon, um, what I think I'll be doing at U University of Michigan and a new um, something I've started, which is called the Solar Punk Design Academy. So um, I, I, I am now currently in the position where it's, it's one of my jobs to mentor junior faculty. So <laughs> I, I do have some lessons learned. I don't know who the audience is today other than me, myself, 10 these are just things I hear myself telling um, junior faculty when they're feeling, you know, panicked about um, where things are going and how quickly they should be getting there. 
Um, and the first one is to be generous. And it sounds insane for people who are probably working too many hours and just don't have the bandwidth to do the next thing, but um, it really does come back around and time spent um, listening to projects, giving feedback, sharing ideas, being generous with credit when you're authoring things together, collaborating, um, even just crits, reviews, and, and speaking events, I think is um, is all worth it. I'm, I've always learned something from it, and typically there's some new exciting something that um, that, that might lie around the corner from um, being generous with time in that way. I've also found it really good to work with good people um, as opposed to the other kind. <laughs> um, it's a Duke Ellington reference, but yeah, there's 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 good people and there's not so good people, and you can decide how you define that. But um, when searching for mentors, collaborators, co-authors, even students that you're going to collaborate with in some way outside, you know, outside coursework, um, you know, it's it's really worth it to find the people that are not doing the same kind of work but are more like-minded, um, and I think that becomes more important, um, particularly if you're building, you know, multi-year multi-project research programs have been so fortunate to have um, really wonderful mentors that are in you know totally different disciplines. One of my favorite collaborators ever is a historian and I call her my academic big sister. You know, it's like she's my big sister at work, but also in like every other way. So um, it's really, I think, important to find those people um, and build those relationships. It makes it all worthwhile. Um, say yes and say no, right? Like, so saying yes to the good people and the good work and the good projects, but also getting comfortable saying no to those things that maybe have some other, <laughs> other motives that might not align with yours. And so my favorite example is the college holiday card that I said no to, to a former dean the first time he asked and the second time and the third time when he wasn't asking, I still told him no. And eventually somebody else designed it and it was fine. He didn't talk to me for two years, but I was able to accomplish <laughs> those things that were, um, that were really important to me. So when I have junior faculty, you know, struggling to identify, you know, this, there's a really great project that came up, but I don't think it really fits my research plan. Like, well, if it's good people and it's, it's good project, I think you need to do it and you can um, find a way to connect the dots later. Um, I use this term, I, I, for me, it's been mostly, you know, really big grant opportunities, but I think other kinds of shiny things can be distracting. Um, and I, I like this term idea debt that I've heard from my, um, my own, uh, my own advisor, Jonathan Chapman at Carnegie Mellon, the idea that sometimes a really great project uh, takes like 17 more than you imagine steps to get there. And so um, in my experience, sometimes going for the big grant um, is really more trouble than it's worth and it might actually detour the project. And so that may be part of what you need to do or want to do, but sometimes I think those things can also take you. Um, a lot of pressure, uh, <laughs> so I should probably wrap up here. Um, uh, the last one, um, which I think is is a good one to remember here is you know to keep going but to be patient and um this i think has to do with the fact that your your research program your research agenda will certainly be defined and redefined many times um there will be an opportunity i'm sure to connect the dots again and again and again um so saying yes to those good things find those finding those collaborators um avoiding <laughs> too much shininess um might be worthwhile um and just kind of stick to what seems like it's the right path so um, I appreciate uh, the time and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you all so much <laughs> for being here, for sharing all this. Okay, Heather's got a copy of yeah, Matthew's book. book. Just like trying, yeah. yeah. I want Thank you to you. virtually sign it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, all right. Just... Thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Dan, are we able to... Um, allow others into the space to ask questions or should we use the chat feature? We want to let them in. Yeah, we want to let people in to talk. We like to see people. Yeah, because we can't see any of our guests here besides just us. <laughs> they just keep texting me <laughs> from the other side. <laughs> the, the other side. <laughs> Dan's back. Uh, Dan saying, please raise your hand to be let in. Raise it like virtual. Yeah, like in the, yeah. And he will allow you into the space and we can have a Q&A here. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Chris, who will be one of our CAA panelists. 
I'm out of focus and I look as sick as I feel, I guess. Oh no. <laughs> you said we were Zoom rusty, sort of. Here we we were earlier, yeah. Hello, Maria. Hi, how are you guys? Hi. Do y'all mind if I go ahead and I just have oh, a really please? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so currently, uh, I'm actually a student of Heather's at Washington University in St. Louis. <laughs> um, and I'm originally a public health slash anthropology major. Um, and my minor is actually in human computer interaction. Um, and this is my senior year, but I'm just now really getting into design and kind of realizing that this is a path that I would like to um seriously pursue but there's just like so much going on at once sometimes it can seem uh like so much so does anybody have any advice especially if you're coming from a more of an arts and science background um into getting into the design world and what my opinion seems so late but probably I'm only 21 so like probably not that late but if there's any advice on how to kind of like narrow down that path or is it kind of just like a shoot and miss, see what you like, and kind of keep going into that. Panelists, anyone want to go for that one? <laughs> go for that question? Yeah, sorry, it was, a, it was kind of a big question, so. Such a big, good question. Well, I got my MFA at 40, so it's never too late. <laughs> I was in my mid-30s. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I took a big gap between degrees to get some just experience. I did the same MFA at 40. <laughs> and I will say I started graduate school right after undergrad because I think I was feeling similarly that um, I had been a computer science major and I had done some design work uh, through some research opportunities that I'd had as an undergrad but wasn't feeling totally confident that I could get hired as a designer. So I felt that I needed to go uh, to graduate school. And then I got offered a job while I was in graduate school. Uh, so I um, decided to do that instead. But I went back to grad school in my 30s. Uh, and it was it was a better time for me to be in grad school. Yeah, I went to grad school, at, yeah, in my 30s. Um, and I think there were three of us that were sort of in a similar-ish age. And it was, it felt like, oh, there was a big gap. But I mean, for, for me, I felt like I, I came with a with a lot more information that I wanted to parse and think about and and just could already just be in my in my head to consider to bring into the room to bring into a project. So I say like, that's, I think that's, that's the place you want to be. Like where you are right now is exactly where that is. And it's not too early or too late or anything. It's just you're you're exactly positioned in an excellent place where you're now able to activate what you've been kind of the world that you've been in, in with the tools and strategies that you're starting to to work with now. Thank you. That was really helpful. I'm so Any happy other... that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for our panelists today? Chris? Hi, <clears throat> thanks. Um, I have a question about mentorship. Um, I'm in a pretty small uh, department. There's only one uh, full tenure track, uh, only one uh, professor of design with tenure. Um, everybody else is uh, uh, in, in early in the process. So I'm having uh, trouble finding mentorship, trying to figure out kind of next steps. I've truthfully been using, uh, Heather, I've been using your Instagram basically as my mentorship. I follow, I'm like, what's going on? Oh, okay. And then, uh, and, join events like this one in fact um so i'm um, yeah uh beyond heather's instagram um i'm wondering <laughs> if uh anybody has any ideas about kind of wow i'm so <laughs> sorry <laughs> this gets fantastic I better make it better <laughs> i learned about softball with your daughter and um, <laughs> and about events like this so it's great great Okay, if I throw out an answer. So now that I'm a professor emeritus and have a lot of time on my hands, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> mentoring mentoring people is something I enjoy doing. Um, but, but to that end, I've actually uh, thrown up a consulting practice where I'm trying to formalize this and see if it's something that, you know, as a, as a discipline, we can actually say this is valuable and is needed and, and how do we achieve it, you know, especially in a small program like 
what you mentioned, Chris. Um, <clears throat> at the University of Minnesota, we had about 10 graphic design faculty. About half of them were tenure, tenure track. And the other half were, you know, either um, uh, adjunct or what we called um, uh, academic professionals, non-tenure track. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the mentoring is really helpful because it's uh, it's a way of passing on some like, you know, institutional knowledge that people have that have been in the trenches for decades and um, also offer, you know, sort of different pathways from the kind of pressures and, and even biases that are inherent in a lot of tenure processes where the people judging you that are above you, uh, you know, have certain things they want you to achieve. And there might be other other things that are valuable in our discipline that could come from, uh, you know, sort of outside sources or lateral sources. That's great. I'll say uh, I found peer mentoring really valuable and really useful. Um, I was very lucky that uh, a number of people I graduated uh, with at the same time from graduate school also got faculty jobs around the same time. And being able to share notes and say, have you ever been asked to do this? Is this weird? Uh, and has been really valuable. Um, I'm the only junior faculty in my program who's tenure track. And my colleagues are really wonderful and really supportive. But when I ask them stuff like, what did you do for your pre-tenure review at the three-year mark, they're like, oh, I don't remember, because uh, a lot of them are full professors now. And so being able to share notes with other people at similar positions, although the requirements vary wildly from institution to institution, I'm learning, um, has been uh, super, super helpful. I feel like now more than ever, like you, there's some like, being able to reach out and have a really sort of casual conversation with other people who are in education. It, it feels like, and maybe this is just, I don't think it's just a, um, you know, a product of the last, you know, two or three years, but I think it's a really generous community and spaces like this, um, you know, and, and, um, and also, you know, similar to how Kate was saying, the, there's other folks that graduating alongside with other folks who are kind of at similar levels at other institutions that you're curious about, um, in a way, like if we decide that we can be generous to each other, like as we are not in the same institution, then we can build like a, maybe a more positive kind of way of being able to grow up and through and support each other in this way. Um, so I, I feel like that's, that's, I've definitely found peer um, so other peers at other institutions being um, a really nice way of just having a reality check too of like, oh, okay, like that is realistic there. Oh, this is not realistic here, but it's realistic there. And just being able to um, to uh, to see that it's almost like transferring schools, right? You kind of see what was going on in one and you can sort of see how it works in another. Um, and um, and that, that feels both exciting and informative. Thanks everybody. That's fantastic. Take a screen grab. I would just add one thing, which is different than mentorship, but if it come when it comes to um, the tenure process, um, again, as has been said, different institutions are very different. But um, if there's if there's an opportunity to participate in any of the committees that are part of that process before you're um, actually going through it, it's really helpful to see how that process unfolds. And just knowing the knowing the exact language of the criteria that you're going to be evaluated against is becomes very important when you get get up to um to actually applying do we have more questions i know jess and i have some but we're the least important so yeah. i want to let other people go the space is for everybody else first <laughs> Um, Lisa, I was wondering where, where your articles end up that you said you were working on some of them. Yes, um, well, one of them will be in um, intercom. Um, it's a guest edited issue by Amanda Horton and um, and Jacqueline. It starts with a D last name that I'm not remembering at this moment. Please forgive me if you're out there. Um, uh, they're guest editing an issue. Um, for um, for Intercom Magazine, which is the Society of Technical Communications, which um, I mean was partially through Amanda. I've, I'm familiar with her work as a, another design professor in graphic design history, so being able to kind of see um, her working in that kind of space and sort of encouraging the community to contribute to it—that was that's where one of them um, will be. 
um, and the other, um, uh, I think it's a cinema oriented magazine or is it a similar cinema oriented journal. And I can come back to you with the name of it if you're curious, Elizabeth. Um, but um, uh, I think the theme of this particular guest edited issue is about sort of like trauma or, or a trauma objects. Um, and in a way, like the the prompt that was given in the um, in the call for proposals was what kind of piqued my interest in a way I kind of love reading calls for response calls for calls for papers and calls for work in part because it's just nice to hear like what are other folks thinking about and how are others wording that um so in a way I don't typically you know sort of apply to the whole bunch of these but that one really piqued my interest and sort of really felt aligned so it was like through a little sort of a little bit of digging in my own head and sort of um sort of maybe on also talking with the editors the co-editors of that issue um that sort of conceived of the the proposal that I that I ended up um uh, have started to work on with them so um so hopefully by the end of this year be like early next year um so um so yeah I'm excited to start sort of thinking about and, and contributing contributing in that kind of space super cool other questions don't be shy anything goes I'm curious about the dissemination venues. Uh, I really enjoyed all three of the presenters, uh, very diverse research agendas and creative practice uh, programs to, to use a, a new word I've just learned from Matthew. Um, so I'm curious about where where people go to uh, to get their work out there, to get it under uh, peer review, uh, jury, uh, you know, some selection criteria that shows that it's important, relevant, rigorous, impactful, and so on. So, sorry, are you asking like from each panelist kind of where they've been sharing their work, right? Well, yeah, in general. I mean, I know, yeah. for example, that, that, that Matthew's book about design and capitalism was published by the MIT Press. Okay. Right. So that, that's an example of, a, of a, a venue that, you know, he had to submit it and it had to go through uh, a rigorous review process, um, you know, and it, it was published with their imprint. So what other kinds of, of venues, forums, um, you know, peer reviewed is primarily what I'm interested in because that's, you know, more of the gold standard in academia, but there are also a lot of invitational opportunities or competitions, festivals, things like that, where, where people can get their work uh, out there and get exposure for it. So, yes, I'm curious what, what people are finding. What, you want to go through one by one, Kate? Do you want to start? Sure. Um... This one is a hard one for me because I don't feel like I have a consistent uh, place that I've been uh, showing my work. And uh, my strategy is that I'm just I'm bookmarking things on Instagram that sound interesting <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hoping they eventually make it into my calendar as a reminder that the deadline is out there. Um, I also like to uh, engage my work with uh, tech conferences and audiences uh, as well. I don't know if this is going to hurt me uh, when I find out how my uh, pre-tenure review that I submitted in December went. Uh, but I just think that uh, in terms of who I want to be seeing my work and thinking about it and maybe feeling a little uncomfortable <laughs> uh, about my work, that's definitely an important audience for me. Um, I've really had to change uh, how I think about uh, things to submit to in terms of building out my uh, tenure case. And I don't know if I like that <laughs> or not yet, and if that's the right thing for me. Um, so that's just something that's been on my mind. Um, Kate, I feel like you're being so humble too, because you did have a pretty significant work at the San Francisco MoMA. So I'm just going to call you out for that. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, some would probably be interested if you're comfortable sharing like how that manifested. Uh, thanks, Heather. Um, the answer to that is I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> the, the assistant curator for the uh, in the photography uh, program at SF MoMA reached out to me because they were putting together a show um, about uh, male art and artists sharing images with each other over time and wanted some present day examples uh, that kind of handled similar topics and I I thought that another artist who was in the show who some had been a guest lecturer 
uh, in the program I was in in grad school maybe had uh, mentioned that he liked my work because he'd included it uh, in a presentation that he'd given uh, that I had seen elsewhere. Uh, but when I asked him about it at the opening, he said it wasn't him. So I don't, so I actually don't know. <laughs> it's mysterious, even better somehow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll add, I, I was sort of on the um, editorial team for Visible Language, so I can't not <laughs> say anything about that. I mean, it's the, um, the longest running peer reviewed journal in design since 1967. There's the pitch. Okay, and so we're always um, accepting um, uh, submissions for um, double blind peer reviewed articles related to visual communication design research. Um, there are many, many others. There's a long list growing in the chat. Um, but, um, you know, because I, because I do that, I, I mean, I read a lot of design research papers have there's kind of an element I think of coaching that goes into that too sometimes the research sounds good but the writing doesn't make clear what happened um, sometimes the writing's clear but the research isn't clear what happened so um, it's it's actually been one of those moments where I mean you know peer review is another moment of being generous it takes a decent amount of time and attention I think to do a good peer review but you know you become a better writer <laughs> and you may be a better researcher because of it so um, that's been really really valuable um, because I because I'm in that role, I, I don't publish invisible language because that would be weird. So um, some of the journals that are that are listed here are, are I think, other other great recommendations. I mean, Shiji and uh, Design Issues and the International Journal of Design all all kind of really stand out in my mind. I feel like for me, I I, I um I don't know if these are these this is a good example or not, but I um uh for example, going through websites like. New York Foundation of the Arts and just going through the opportunities and kind of just like doing a scrape through being like what sounds reasonable and not like a really wild wildly disorganized situation is trying to sort of like get other folks out there you know so I mean I feel like it's it's totally a mix right it's not quite like going on Craigslist but it is definitely like you don't know what you're gonna find you might find something interesting you might not um but I love reading through things like that um I mean it's I, I think I'm trying to find quickly the ones that I go through but um for example Oprah winter break um I just I went through an afternoon through several websites and through some residency space, like sort of like listings and things and just put all the deadlines and their descriptions in a things to do list. So I have all of them in chronological order. So whenever I feel like, okay, like, do I want to be thinking about some sort of like externally connected thing that I thought was interesting when I was looking through this earlier in January? Um, I mean, one, it's sort of like slightly curated because at least it went through my filter. Two, it gives me some sense of, you know, I'm not, I don't have to go for all of them because that is not what I need to do, but it's sort of there for me and it motivates me to be curious about it. And I think as someone who has not quite written a book yet, it hasn't quite had the SF MoMA, um, I think I'm sort of maybe a representing kind of like a sort of stepping into that space and wondering, okay, where are the spaces that maybe are accessible and sort of increasingly sort of curious and confident in those spaces. Um, so that's definitely where a lot of, um, you know, the group shows and um, maybe sort of uh, juried shows and things like that have come for me over the last six years. And I think maybe more recently kind of being, if not more selective, just like more particular about kind of making sure that anything I do apply for sort of feels definitely aligned to something I'm already working on and to have more things working on. So instead of saying, oh, that looks interesting, maybe that relates to the shiny thing um, earlier, right? Whether it's a grant or a publication or otherwise, but um, not just like, oh, that sounds interesting. How can I fit into that? But more like I'm reading through them and being like, oh, okay, like this is a thing that I'm doing that that could connect with this in this way. And I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm in the midst of it. So, you know, check back in five years and see how that how that's going um, over here. 2.2. I find the answer is very refreshing because uh, 10 or 20 years ago, people would have said print, CA, or fees, you know, sort of all the, the uh, round up usual suspects of, of graphic design industry magazines that have competitions that, that are really a, a sort of economic model for how to, how to sell magazines and how to squeeze uh, entry fees out of people. So um, it's refreshing to see there are a lot of alternative venues out there that are about furthering the discipline intellectually and creatively, and not just about you know lining the pockets of a publisher or or some organization that gets a lot of entry fees. So, um, but, but even the AIGA, you know, the AIGA, if you look at their most recent um, entry fees for competition, it's, it's an outrageous amount of money they're asking for. I think it's, uh, I, I think you know, it's okay to ask for a, a modest amount, twenty, thirty bucks, you know, but. 
uh, SEGD, what are they, like 165 or something for an entry? It's, it's, it's outrageous. Anyway, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm ranting. I'm ranting. <laughs> I do have questions for the panelists, unless anybody else wants to jump in with a question, either here in the space uh, on video or in the, the chat. Going once, going twice. <laughs> okay, my question, and this, this is sparked from um, Matthew's mention of program, because I related to that quite a bit when you were talking about just thinking more programmatically with your work. And I'm curious with all three of you, um, from when you, started your path on um, design research and scholarship, did you find that you were just sort of like intuitively making choices on what you were gonna do as you moved along? Or did you find yourself spending time just kind of like drawing things out and being like very much more strategic with like how going, you're going from like place to place or point to point? I'm curious how that path formed uh, for each of you. I'll, I'll say okay, something Go ahead. Be brief. Um, I mean, I think for me, um, I was at Parsons, I was an adjunct, and they had a thousand dollar sort of like part time development fund. And I'd never seen that before. And I don't know if they have them. I imagine that they still have this kind of thing. But I remember thinking, oh, wow, a part time development fund, like, you can get money to do a thing? What? Um, and that was really the first time that I even thought that going to a conference was a thing to do and sort of seeing, hearing about that from other faculty. And um, I had been a part of a pretty large sort of collaborative project that involved a lot of um, sort of parties and felt like there was sort of uh, maybe a perspective about being a graphic design, communication design faculty, coordinating kind of between, or not just not being the coordinator, but being a part of this large coordination felt like a special story. So I shared that at a conference and it was like a very, um, you know, sort of an initial try in, in some way at sharing pedagogical results. And um, and I want to say that I think design incubation, was it started by 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 then? I don't remember what year that was, but um, but it was around right around 2011 for me when I went to that conference. Um, but um, but it was it was it was wonderful to see that this was a regular thing. And also it was surprising for other folks that were at that conference. They were like, wait, you're part time. Why are you here? Like you would only go to these conferences if you're tenure track. And I was like, no, I just I thought I would try. I don't know. Um, so in a way, I think just wanting to share realizing that these are these are ways to do that. I think that's how I maybe dare I say organically, but I think began to sort of explore that there's a way to be able to have have this job do these things and then have it be something that's worth talking about at another stage when I have some reflections about it. So seeing that that back and forth was maybe the beginning for me. Yeah, I think being in a place where I'm I'm kind of in between starting some new work now, what uh how I've been thinking about this is uh and because like I said, I lost some momentum on my practice over the last few years. I've been trying to uh do more things that are local or things that are smaller, uh, just to get things moving again and to also take off some of the pressure of, oh, it's been a while since I had something big. So the next thing I do has to be really big. Uh, and instead, you know, knowing that I have to be making some little things for the next big thing to come along. So I'm trying to um, apply to things that sound interesting, but that are not um, that are that are just from smaller venues or smaller galleries uh, that I feel are a particularly good fit or really well aligned um, with what I want to do and hoping that that will uh, build up some more momentum for bigger things later. Yeah, I think I touched on this a little bit in the presentation. I think it, it was it was fortunate that I sort of found collaborators who are not designers. They were humanists and historians and architects and things like that early on. and. Um, because of some of that early work, I, I remember the first conference presentation I gave, I was, it was a digital humanities conference. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and, um, and it was, um, you know, demonstrating some experimental stuff with conductive inks to make like, you know, legible type, like big typography out of circuits and stuff like that. And, um, 
afterwards, the, uh, the, all the digital humanist scholars came and told me, they said, wow, your presentation was the coolest one. <laughs> and I laughed. I was like, I guess it's not the best, but it was the coolest. <laughs> I guess that was, it felt like that was sort of my, my role as the designer in that, <laughs> in that, in that room. Um, but it, it, there was something about those early experiences that helped me realize like, wow, even, even here in this space, whatever it is that I'm doing is, is, is interesting and valuable in some way. Um, and in, in some ways that, that was building confidence to then do the next thing, do the next thing. Um, and, and I think it took me a while to come back towards doing research or writing that I thought was, you know, more directed at design in some way. It was really about these kinds of design methods, finding use in, in other kinds of research contexts. Um, but, but nonetheless, it was, you know, it was a productive journey. All right, thank you. Heather, you have a question, right? Yeah, they're kind of being answered in a roundabout way, but um, I mean, I guess it's the two overarching things, right? Like for, for the three panelists in particular, like what has been the greatest support for your research? I mean, you might say it's the community, it's people, it's money, it's time, um, and then, you know, of course, the other side of that, like, what has been the biggest hurdle? Like, for me, I always need more funding, and I can't get funding because my projects are subversive, and they scare people, you know, so that's my hurdle. Um, but my, you know, greatest sor source of support is people, like all my mentors and friends here um, that deal with my nonsense, <laughs> and my texting. So um, yeah, I would love if the panelists can answer that concisely. You want me to say it again? I'll, I'll go. We'll go we'll the other. <laughs> All right. I mean, I, I agree. I think the I think the people people around me and and some of them are in in the institution and the program I'm in, and some of them are not, and some of them are, um, you know, people I've met along the way, um, people I've collaborated with or in other institutions. Um, you know, this, this, yeah, the, the, just somebody to listen <laughs> to some crazy idea for long enough for you to hear yourself say it and be like, oh, that's, that's, that's not quite right. Um, and um, I think for, for me, the hurdle, I, I've, um, yeah, money has not been such an issue, which isn't to say that there's been a lot of it, but just that it, it hasn't been the thing that's holding, holding back whatever needs to happen. Maybe the projects just don't need that much money. Um, but, but time, is, is of course difficult. And so I think, um, you know, Lisa was mentioning, I was also in a 3-3 teaching situation in the run up to tenure. And, you know, that's that's just a lot of time in the classroom and checking the emails and grading the projects and things like that. It's really makes it hard to carve out time for other things. And so that's where um, getting creative with how service teaching and research are not three things <laughs> can, be, can be useful and maybe just necessary in order to, to do all three simultaneously. Hey, or Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I'll say that, um, I mean, I, I feel like our, our department is really supportive of each other. I mean, we're fairly small, there's four of us, um, but I think between the chair and between all the four of us as as peers to one another, um, there's there's a lot of support and, and want there. Definitely feeling like, um, you know, sort of like these inter interinstitutional friendships, kinships, um, every once in a while, um, conversation ships. Um, I feel like those are where um, I'm sort of reminded that like, right, there, we're all like being fascinated, interested in making, making things move and making things work. Um, and, um, and I definitely feel like, you know, sort of going from um, being in a, being in a three, three teaching, I think it's definitely allowed me to, to love teaching, to be, to be an educator, to, to, to keep learning how to do this increasingly better and figure and listen to the students and listen to myself in different ways. I mean, I, I feel like I would never, I would never change not to be like, I would never change that, but I feel like I, I definitely want to continue doing that as, as long as it makes sense. Um, uh, but yeah, absolutely to, to be able to think, and I think you said it really beautifully, which is like, how do you think about those three things, not as three things, but as sort of like these three interweaving sort of modes that, that are giving value to one another and that it doesn't feel like we're sort of turning off one mode in order to shift to the next or that you're only saying no to all of these different things when they're also enriching and they should be a part of the texture of this, this life that, you know, we've chosen, which is this mix of, of, of making and thinking and, and sharing it <laughs> in, in some rotation. 
I think I'll also say that a lot of the support is through like mentorship and my peers and my colleagues. Um, my colleagues at my current institution are always sending me stuff like you should apply for this, uh, not not and not getting upset at me if I don't, um, but just it really um, I can feel like I said before I'm the only untenured junior faculty uh, at my institution and I I can feel how much my colleagues <laughs> really want me to get tenure and I really appreciate that uh, that they're looking out for me and uh, similarly uh, one of my colleagues also does a lot of work in open source software and has already done a lot of arguing with the administration who may not understand uh, the importance or value of that work in the sense that a lot of it is not necessarily peer reviewed, um, but still has a really broad impact. And so um, I, I think that I don't have to make as hard of a case as he did <laughs> uh, when he went through earlier, because at least in the program, there's an agreement that that work is really valuable. Um, the biggest challenge is, I would say, I'm still learning how to organize my time uh, just and how to count things when I talk to uh, people outside of my program about is this research, is this service, um, and what they expect to see for that uh, is something that I am still finessing <laughs> uh, when I write uh, my evaluations and things like that. Any other that questions? Definitely. I know we're getting close to time. I want to add one more thing on the time management part. <laughs> I think the, the hardest part for me is actually making time for my own work uh, because it always feels like, oh, someone asked me for something. So, and, and now I feel that I, um, they're waiting on me and they need something from me and I, I owe a response to this thing. And that's, that's the hardest part is, is sort of making space to say it's okay if this doesn't happen for a week <laughs> uh because i have to i've already committed to giving uh the time for myself that's that's the hardest part Heather, can i just add one thing that because time is up soon that when i came to my institution i'm working at uw medicine one of the greatest advice from my senior professors by Reno. So you can see <laughs> like this. Yes, I think could it would work too many times. Thank you. Thanks, Yo. Yeah, maybe just doubling on that. I feel like the day to day, definitely Google Cal seems like all the way. Um, but like the long term or like the medium to long term things where it's it's almost like this sort of accountability journal. I I started that this year, I think in part because I think between <laughs> between multiple people, probably many people on this call, um, just sort of seeing that and, and being like, well, that's that's one of the things that you can do to to try to to try to see it, visualize it and, and to make it to to um to check in on yourself. So yeah, I, I love I love that you <laughs> showed us your your note. Should we start to wrap up? I think we are. Yeah. Uh Patricia, did you have a question? Your hands raised. That'd be our last one. I think she's just muted. You're, oh, muted. you're muted. Yeah, Hi, but we're we're. Hey, how is everybody? Good to see you. <laughs> Good to um, see. You. We're wrapping up, but my question is almost hard to answer. But if you have something that you think is kind of crazy, you know, and is is it worth going anywhere? Who do you talk to about like getting feedback on it? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good question. That's a really good question. What but I also know you're finishing, so. <laughs> what kind of crazy are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, Depends. we want to know. <laughs> oh, you, it, that would take too long. But the I level just, of crazy. <laughs> it can always be crazy, definitely. <laughs> it might have, I, I like to look at things that maybe are transdisciplinary. Um, and so I kind of know one side of it and I know how they might fit together, but I also need advice. Is it is it interesting to this group or that group? Um, mm. I, you know, I could I can re I could spend all my life doing research, but it's moving on to the next step. Um, that's difficult for me and knowing is it a worthwhile pursuit? Because I think Matthew, you're talking about focus. Um, how do you keep that? How do you know to keep going? 
Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. How to answer a question? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think the I, I think the the I mean, the right person to bounce that idea off has to be somebody not too close to what that means. You know, I mean, it, it or maybe a little bit of both. I mean, maybe somebody you really trust that's in a design space and somebody that's pretty far out there. You know, because uh, there was a great comment in the chat somewhere. I, I lost it here, but somebody said, you know, sometimes. Um, other people are really good at seeing a side of your work that you're not good at seeing. And I think that that can be really, I agree with that comment. I think that can be really true, um, especially if the idea is new and not all the way there, you know, um, there's there's probably a, a nugget in there that somebody else might call out that's really not what you were thinking about. And that could be a new pathway. Um, I think the focus comes when you have to start trimming the thing down, whatever, you know, whatever metaphor you want here as it starts to grow and it needs to go somewhere. Um, but, you know, the, I think that, you know, there there are, there are certainly those moments when, um, you know, I, you know, if you're particularly in like a research university and going up for tenure, you probably don't want all of your publications to be in a different field. I mean, I would wonder about that if I was reviewing somebody's um, tenure dossier, but that you're publishing in multiple communities of scholarship is, is a, actually I think a plus, you know, so that you might, I'm certainly worked with, um, collaborators where we're both co-authoring papers and they're going to really different contexts and I'm talking about the design side and she's talking about something else. So um, those kinds of things can be really, really productive. Thank you. Yeah, I would say just like, I think socializing an idea is such a powerful thing, you know, like whether it's um, and I think talking to people who aren't designers, I mean, that's definitely, you know, a, a important sort of aspect in a way, because in a way you want to be able to sort of like look outside of discipline, right? Like, as you're saying, all of these things are sort of beyond any one discipline space. Um, so, I mean, I think see, seeing that there's probably communities, you know, that are, that are connected to some of those things, like getting, getting on one of their, in one of their webinars or sort of like their kind of um, conversations like this. Um, I think it's amazing, like how, what kinds of conversations come from applying to something random. Um, I definitely feel like, you know, I talked at a metaverse conference last year about something that I thought was interesting about that space. And I don't, I'm not an expert at all in that space. Um, I bet is anyone like, you know, um, so in a way, like I sort of propose an idea that I thought I, I think of, and somehow that was useful to someone and who knows, maybe they just accepted everything. I have no idea. Um, but it was so much fun to connect with a completely different world of, you know, humans online and, um, and yeah, and also just have the exercise for myself to say like, yeah, like what is, um, you know, to ask the questions that I had and to then to have and to just say them for 20 minutes. Um, so I don't know. So I, I think I'm, I'm encouraged by both the the ease and also the sort of the, the practice of of practicing socializing because, you know, no, no idea is precious or precious enough to not share it a little bit because um, then it'll it can grow. It can it can it can go somewhere from there. So I feel encouraged in that. I think I still have a couple of close friends from grad school that I most like sharing uh, the rawest ideas with. Uh, one is a performance artist, the other has a background in film, uh, but I've just always felt that they've really, uh, they've really understood me. And so they're good at asking me really pointed questions <laughs> about where something is going so that it, even when I'm not sure, um, talking to them really helps me figure it out. And yeah, I'm really grateful for that. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your excellent presentations. It was so exciting to have you. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, thank you for being here. Thank you, panelists, for your time putting those together. Yes, yes. And speaking on a Friday afternoon. We appreciate it. The weekend begins right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Is DI, are we staying on? for a sec. I don't know. Yeah. Okay.